Hello and welcome to a new episode of Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. This is a show where we try to dive into my old ideology, which we most often call social justice ideology, and give people different ways of uh, helping to understand what it is and helping me to understand what it is. So I'm joined today by my co-host, Carter Laren. Hello, Carter. Hey, Carrie. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. Uh, I'm excited to be on this particular deprogrammed because yes. uh, I'm excited about our guest. Is it time? Can I introduce our guest? Yeah. We uh, met her so today, at Porkfest. Yes, we met her at Porkfest. And uh, she made, I think a lot of people remember this woman from Porkfest because several times she stood up uh, in the Q&A for many uh, speeches and really let them have it in a in a in a great way, uh, railing against social justice ideology and critical race theory. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Lily Tang Williams. Lily grew up in communist China during Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution. She was a member of the infamous Red Guard before she moved to America over 30 years ago. Today, she highlights similarities between China's Cultural Revolution and the current culture war in the United States, speaking out against the dangers of critical race theory and other radical leftist ideas that have seeped into the American mainstream. She's contributed her opinion articles to National Review, Town Hall, The Epic Times, Union Leader, and The Concord Monitor. She's also appeared on Fox News, John Stossel, Joe Page's show, many other shows and podcasts. Lily is on the Speakers Bureau of Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. She's been speaking to students in middle schools, high schools, and colleges in the past four years across the country. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter at Lily4, that's the number four, Liberty. Uh, on YouTube, you can find her, it's, she's Lily Tang Williams. And on Facebook, she's Lily for Liberty. We'll put the links to all that stuff in the show notes below. Lily, welcome to Deprogrammed. Well, thank you for having me. Nice to see you both here with me. It would be fun to have a conversation. It will be fun. It, um, it was fun yeah. to mix it up with you at Porkfest because I was giving a lecture about my experience in social justice and you had one of the best comments. You came up to the microphone and started talking about your your history, your background and blew us away. I'm, I'm just really happy that you had time to come and tell our audience today about your experiences. Right, because uh, um, I was uh, very um, interested in your stories. You said that you were in social justice movement for 20 years. That's that's a long time. That's a lifetime almost. And, uh, and I was in China, of course, uh, being indoctrinated by a communist regime and the party. And I, le I left China just right before my 24th birthday. <laughs> That's also a lifetime. It's, it, it just, uh, so we, 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 we have something in common and we finally all wake up. And so this is where we need to kind of have a conversation about, uh, you know, how we woke up and what uh, worked and how we can have a conversation to and keep engaging the people who are currently still in this social justice movement especially young people, because I really see them as some kind of uh, um, victims of indoctrination. They don't know the history. They don't know how dangerous if we go down this path. And uh, the Marxism, communism is really some kind of ideology. It sounds beautiful. It, it's like a utopian society. It's just, uh, it never came. And, uh, and it will in actually empower dictators to have a full control for every individual's life and throw everybody under the bus, basically. It doesn't matter you support them or not. They, they are just used to achieve, you know, um, their agenda. So, you know, I, I'm looking forward to that conversation. Maybe we, can we start by, and this might shock you being someone who grew up in the Cultural Revolution in China and knowing how bad it was. But I think many Americans just don't know anything about it. And so when you say we when we say, oh, she grew up during the Cultural Revolution, people who know what that means are horrified. But I think most people kind of sounds like, all right, what the heck's the Cultural Revolution? Did you did you like do some cool art in China? What happened between <laughs> 1966 and 1976 in China? What is the Cultural Revolution and why should we care about it? 
So you are right. It was uh, um, 10 years uh, um, from 1966 to 1976. 10 years cultural revolution started by Mao, the chairman Mao Zedong, who was, you know, China's uh, leader. And uh, because he, um, his central planning policies prior years before that uh, made uh, like a mass famine happen in China, about 20 to 30 million people estimate to be starving to death. So he lost some power and within the Communist Party. So he traveled to outside of Beijing, started the Cultural Revolution by use of propaganda to basically to purge his political enemies. But he used this wonderful campaign called Getting Rid of Four Olds. That means old ideas, old habits, old culture, and old customs of a Chinese society said that there were some bad influencers in our society. We need to get rid of them. And, you know, he act like a typical Marxist, right? So basically he put all Chinese, there's lots of Chinese back then, into two giant groups, oppressor versus oppressed. I'm sure you recognize those two groups. Hmm. And hmm. under oppressor group, then there were five black classes. Who was the five black classes who were supposed to be oppressors? Basically, the rich, farmers, landlords, capitalists, rightists, bad influencers. Sounds very subjective and arbitrary. Who decides those, right? Basically, anybody who is dissident of the party of Mao can go down to that category, include his enemies within the party. Then five red classes supposed to be under oppressed like me, a child of working poor class, peasants, you know, revolutionary heroes and Communist Party, carters, officials. So you get the Chinese into 10 classes, five red, five black. And we supposed to hate each other and fight to the nail against each other. So I was brainwashed during that time. Just those bad people, we need to eliminate them. So, so some people start to get to know the term now called the struggle sessions, like we, we, we saw, because today the critical race theory make people to go to similar sessions where people are separated according to classes, but today is separated by their race. So the struggle sessions were, you, you normally during the Mao's Cultural Revolution were holding a big, nice square public opinion place where the you know, red guards will you know, code their face up to say the down with those five black classes and confess, public shame them, make them denounce themselves. And uh, they were born black classes. So the children have to, in order to come to the red side, they need to turn on their families, you know, change their last names, to say, I hate my grandparents, I hate my parents because they were rich, they were landlords, they exploited workers and peasants. Those, those kids basically had to cut a lot of ties with their families because otherwise they were born that way unless you change your last name and turn your family under the bus. There are lots of tragic stories happen like, you know, during that time, it, it's very sad. And people might not know, the Cultural Revolution basically killed 20 million Chinese, you know, murder, torture, re-educational camps, or some people simply just could not handle the pressure, they kill themselves. My worst nightmare when I was a little girl, I even don't remember my age before elementary school. I was babysitted by my grandmother and the whole courtyard people shared this 20 feet deep water well. We all share one water well. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy floating on the top, like it. And uh, said, people say, come down, say somebody dead, you know, in the water well. Oh my goodness. I mean, I was traumatized. I didn't want to talk about it for a long time. And later I found out, years later, even after I come to this country, I asked my uncle, yeah, what happened to that guy? Oh, he committed suicide. He was black class. He could not handle the struggle sessions. Even though my grandma went to struggle session too for one year because my grandmother married somebody who's supposed to be a outlaw country leader. 
and he was killed by his own man long time ago before you know like but my grandmother married to a red class worker but because her dead husband they want to make her to come out to uh, uh to confess to basically to say hey what did your husband do did he say anything anti-revolutionary anti-government who killed him and, and they went through all the investigation about over a year later then finally to say okay he was killed by his own man and so my grandma just feel like thank goodness because she was going through struggle sessions for about a year and if she was classified as a black class because her husband was killed as a country revolutionary or traitor or something my life could be totally changed because i was supposed to be red but then my grandma could be classified as black it, it just it was very scary so everybody feel relieved up my grandmother basically got off the hook that's how bad the situation was you know imagine can, that people can, don't can we talk about it. yeah can we talk about for a second the fact that a lot of this stuff was not um official government channels but kind of encouraged through mao and through the ccrg to like get students and people to kind of do a lot of this purging on their own on their it own. wasn't it wasn't necessarily this is coming down from the top in a very clear way it was like we kind of know this is what mao wants so we're gonna do it ourselves right because mao's enemies that time were inside of the Communist Party, inside of the central government. The President Liu become a, a more powerful because uh, after Mao got marginalized. So he wanted to use this cultural revolution. He shut down schools. He used propaganda in newspapers, in art, in music. And, you know, every day he got people to sing songs to basically to uh, worship him like a god. And they controlled all the press, all the radio stations, all the periodicals, and all the newspapers, and then all the loudspeakers. That time we had loudspeakers on every community ground. It's like a concentration camp, like 6.30 6 in the morning when I was little. Everybody, listen to this loud music, come on, play some red revolutionary songs, and say, time to get up, time to go to school. And then ba 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 ba, you know, very loud music and very revolutionary. So you could not even sleep in. Everybody had to work. And uh, so he went through this kind of almost suckish, suckish, you know, channel to also get the people to hate each other, to fight each other. And, uh, and, and he told the military to stand down, no enforcement to stand down urged full-time students, no school to go to, called the Red Guards, urban youth, very naive, ignorant to be used by him to say, go door to door to search for bad elements, black classes, and looting and burning, fighting, violence was very common. And pretty soon, um, when Mao, in two or three years, become like godlike leader, basically made his enemy inside a party like Mr. Liu got a house arrested, you know, like quit. And then the red cars become violent, violent against each other, two different different groups fighting each other inside the cities. Then Mao sent them away to say, okay, kids, time to go to countryside, get a re-education by the peasants, because he finished using them. He sent them to countryside called the Down to the Mountain campaign to be re-educated by peasants so he can focus on his power back to Beijing like a god and all the young kids sent to countryside for 10 years. My three uncles went to countryside, basically do hard manual labor without diploma, without even wife later, were there for 10 years because if you get married with a local girl, you are not allowed to come back to cities. So they all come back like old pensioners. Nothing, have nothing. <laughs> it's yeah. very sad generation, very sad. I, I and, just, I've been taking some notes and I just wanted to see if we could draw up a quick list of some similarities between what you're describing in the Cultural Revolution and social justice ideology currently as it operates in the United States and other parts of the West. And some of the similarities of what you're saying is 
I see, and if I'm leaving some out, let me know, but it both, it, they divide people up into classes or groups. And number two, they then, they then assign categories to these groups as oppressor or oppressed. They tell you you're in one of these groups. Then they tell the oppressor groups, they have to confess. They go to these struggle session things. Like we see it a lot of the uh, critical race theory things that are happening at, at, in workplaces and at churches now where the oppressor has to confess their privilege. Um, they encourage you to cut ties with your family. If you're in the oppressor group to, d to make public denouncements about your heritage, about whatever that group status is about something that you as an individual are not responsible for, but they're telling you to accept guilt for that and confess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you talked about destroying the four olds, destroying what amounts to like tradition, destroying culture, destroying the past, um, the use of children, social justice ideology uses children in the same way. Um, and then you said they keep people fighting each other and hating each other, which is something I think people could see that in this past year. I think it's getting worse in the United States, the way that we're at each other's throats, which then leads to, like you said, there's a lot of looting, burning and violence. We've seen that taking place. And then you described how it descended into infighting and these different factions of the Red Guards were fighting. I've seen that happen in social justice groups where they eventually turn on one another. And I think that'll happen here. But the question is like, how much destruction are they going to commit on the way to it all falling apart, you know, before they get sent to re-education camps themselves, you know, now that they've been useful? Would you say, would you add anything? That's a whole list of similarities. Do you think that that's like, that based on what you've said, would you add anything, anything to that? And, and what are the, my question, my other question would be, what are the differences? What makes it, what is different from this and, and the cultural revolution that you went through that makes it hard for us to see it here? Well, don't forget defund the police. Um, so oh, defund the police. Yeah. Defund the police because how do you do cultural revolution if you had a rule of law, you had the people enforce the laws on the books and criminals will be checked. They want the criminals running wild on the streets so they can do violence, lootings, and burnings. And uh, police were told, stand down during the Mao's Cultural Revolution. You can basically witness some black class families were tortured to death. Nobody there to save you. Nobody there to hold violent, criminal, thuggish Red Guards leaders accountable. So I was very afraid that when I saw all those similarities you mentioned, you know, not just me, there are lots of Chinese immigrants from mainland China, my generation, also literally tell them this is a cultural revolution. But they just don't have that, you know, sometimes opportunity or they have worries to come out publicly with it. I mean, there are some you know, um, Chinese moms coming out now to say, stop critical race theory teaching. This is a Mao's cultural revolution, except we Mao used critical class theory, basically mm -hmm. class people by economic wealth status, status mm -hmm. and the political ideology, like which loyalty, where you stand. Even some people might actually support the Communist Party and Mao just because they become dissident. They disagree with some policy issues. Then they want to classify them into pressure class. That means mm -hmm. you're going to be eliminated. You're going to go to labor camps. It's very arbitrary, subjective. And, uh, and I saw that talking of re-education camps from the left side, you know, mm -hmm. either media or even elected, uh, you know, and Congress people, it's like, where did they learn those words? Like, uh, they want to really become fascist, Marxist, Marxist in this country. Don't forget that the BLM leaders come out to say, we are trained Marxist. Yeah. And who trained them? And how much, how long they've been trained? And then later, of course, she bought four houses and with, with all the donations. So, yeah. so well, the social justice warriors, young people who are like you, but they truly believe maybe they're doing something great. Social justice instead of true justice. So social justice, 
and it's just another way that they use that to play identity politics. Yes. That's a typical, typical communist Marxist divide and conquer its identity politics. You are not an individual. Now, instead of class race, cl class theory, we use uh, race theory to divide people by skin color because uh, even Chinese government knows our country has a weak spot where people will buy into those rhetorics because we historically have slavery, has racist history, so they play that card to even after years of um, civil rights movement to say, you are still oppressed. People of color, you are still victims. And blame all on white people. It's like, a, I came here as a foreign student in a foreign land, did not even speak English. I never feel discriminated, oppressed. I come here and I worked hard. American people open their arms to offer help to a stranger. When I first came here as a graduate student, almost 24 years old, I had a hundred dollars. I, I stayed in a white neighborhood in Texas, Austin. My sponsor offered me a free place to stay so I could pay my bills and I could clean and cook. So people I work with in graduate school, they all offered me, do you need a blanket? Do you need clothes? You need a kitchenware? When I got ready to move out, have my own efficiency um, apartment. So I feel American people were so warm and welcoming. I mean, how, how could you convince immigrants like me, lots and lots of them like me, to say America is a systemic racist country? <laughs> White people are born racist. I mean, my husband I met first night when I came to this country. You know, thank God. You know, wow. I was blessed. We've been happily married for 31 years, raised three young adult children now. And uh, how I'm going to say, oh, my husband, entire white family is all racist. How could, I, <laughs> how could I say that? They were so welcoming. They were fascinated by me and by my culture, by my just self, by me being a good um, Chinese native who will, you know, integrate into society and work hard. And I cook some Chinese food too, so they love that. <laughs> and, uh, I told my husband how to use chopsticks and and he told me all about American values because uh, you know my English wasn't good enough. And he taught me a lot of stuff. So because I was so brainwashed in China, I did not have ideology. I was fighting against you know um, the Chinese uh, um, Communist Party bosses in China before I came. But I did not have ideology. So I had to take 20 years of slow learning and waking up with my husband's help. He's a libertarian in heart, so he will tell me about free market economics and the private charity, all those ways to solve society problems, free market capitalism, instead of, I always thought, oh, government got to do that, government got to do that. I mean, after they come to this country, I still say the same thing. I was taught in China, government should do this, government should do that. I was told the same thing, Lily, yeah, here in the United States. Things, right? <laughs> yeah, but I learned. Oh, there are other solutions. There's also an American values and called an individualism. We are not just part of lumbers and the robots and, and collective society and identity politics. We are individuals with individual desires, talent, interest, emotions. We need to be treated like individuals. So I basically took another lifetime, 20 years in this country, to become an independent thinker, 2008. And that was 20 years I come to this country and thank to my um, husband's help, actually. I did start to read some books he recommended me <laughs> with my still not very good English, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can I ask you a question about, there's one other similarity that I see, but maybe I'm wrong and I want you to, to tell me. Because um, so, I think it's, I view it as important. When I read about the Cultural Revolution, one of the things that I notice is that Mao, Mao did not strictly define what Mao Zedong thought was. Like Chen Boda was the supposed kind of expert on Mao Zedong thought, but, and, and he obviously ran the, the CCRG, their, their um, cultural revolution group there. But, um, but Mao kind of intentionally 
held his cards close to his chest and made people guess about what Mao wanted. And that allowed him to be completely arbitrary with respect to who was on the good side and who was on the bad side. And people that you thought were on his side, he would suddenly turn against for some political reason. And he could justify it because there wasn't a clear boundary of like, this is the good thought and this is the bad thought. It was not really clear. And I see social justice, even though there's an apparatus in the US of, you know, whites are oppressive and blah, blah, blah. There also seems to be this vague um, sense that you might not know what they're going to get excited about next. And when they when they when the mob decides this thing matters, you need to fall in line right away. And if you don't or if you don't predict it correctly, you could end up on the wrong side of of the ideology. Well, is that I analogy think, not worth making or is it is it something well, that you, uh, you see? Well, I have a good point. It's extremely arbitrary and subjective and much multi thought, which is uh, basically uh, all summarized articles and slogans he wrote into little red book, Mao's little red book. And today is a little red app by the Xi, Xi you know, like Chairman Xi. But uh, right. when I was little, we had a little read a book. And so you were study, memorize, and chant. But uh, it's all subjective. It can be changed. You know, he's constantly changing. And uh, I think that he's a very thuggish personality, also no heart, no love, no compassion. I, You know, the largest murderer in the world, he could be a sociopath today. You know, just yeah. no, just, you know, you don't see him actually to even smile to the people who treat him like a god, like trying to kiss his hand to, to ask him to help with some, you know, they, they don't even have food to eat. And he just not, did not even smile. If you read this private life of Chiang Mai Mao, but he's a private doctor in China, and he just, no compassion, no expressions. And I did try to look into some theories about critical race theory social justice movement, and the same thing. There's no factual data, history, and facts to back up their claim. It's a theory, like the most critical class theory. This is a class uh, critical race theory, but then it's a theory that you're supposed to believe it, and you're supposed to ask, ask questions. It's almost like a religion. That's what the mouth did. Yes. He become like a god because you know, somebody got to follow religion. You know, not, lots of people today, our kids grow up without, uh, you know, faith and religion. Yeah. But uh, is it horrible to believe in this kind of uh, semi-religious feelings about some theory and the old Marxism? Basically, it's Marxism, communism, become your religion. I was indoctrinated by that religion all my life in China. It was so scary to to see what's going on today on American soil. That's why I feel like, oh, I got to tell my story. I, I don't care what people call me. You can call me racist, whatever, you know, it's like, but I got to tell the truth because people don't know history. When I go to school to talk to middle school, high school students, even college students, they really don't know the horrors of Mao's cultural revolution. When I told them, how many people died? Their eyes were huge. More people died under Mao than under Hitler. They were just yes. shocked because everything they were talking about, fascists, the fascists. You know, do you know fascists were socialists, were communists, collectivists, whatever you want to call them, lots of Same. people died. How come you were anti-fascist? Like some Antifa people claim, but they believe in communists and the Marxists. But they have the same thing. It's like, it's same thing. you know, I don't get it. Yeah. 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 They, I have and, a question and, for you about the, about the, you mentioned it's like a religion. And I think I, I agree with you. It operated very much like a religion for me. What was the attitude in, in Mao's cultural revolution? What was the attitude towards religion, towards any kind of other like religious belief? Well, um, they, first of all, communists, will shut down all competition, all other religions. 
So it doesn't matter. I was raised as Buddhist. If you were Catholic and Christian and uh, and Taoist in China, they banned all religions. Okay, the Communist Party and Mao banned all religions in China during the Cultural Revolution. So basically, all the youth, you 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 have nothing to believe unless you're from some educated family. You were raised differently. If you go to government school like I did from seven until Mao died, I was twelve. You had no other religion. Mao was your god. Communism was your religion. Otherwise, you could not read. You could not wear Mao's red scarf. You could not join the Red Guard. You could not become a Communist Youth member and Communist Party member because, you know, the Communists supposed to be the atheist. You cannot have other gods, but they become your gods. So I I say today that. Uh, if you are white, male, Christian conservatives, and or rich, and, you know, you're privileged, and you're the oppressor class. But then, how about, the, how do you explain, for example, rationally, then how about the, the poor working white people? Some single mothers are very poor, they're white, and they're struggling. Like, where do you put them? Are they supposed to also come out to apologize for their white privilege? They don't feel like they have any privileges. They're still struggling and they're trying to work hard to make ends meet. So this kind of uh, um, basically godless religious feeling they put into young people's head. Even Mao knows young people is like a big piece of white paper. You can draw the best Chinese calligraphy and you can draw the best paintings on a white piece of paper. That's how he saw the young mind that he could use to follow him to do his uh, communist cultural revolution. But he used them to achieve his purge, his power, his total control, and become like their God. To go through rituals, I had to go through even after you know, violent years, it was over. I went to government school for six days a week. You Every 15 minutes in the morning, you hold the mouse middle red book, and you say like, a, Long live Chen Mai Mao, long live Communist Party, 10,000 years, another 10,000 years. I never challenged that. You cannot challenge that. Is he God or is he human? No, it never occurred to my brain. Should I even ask? No. I was so indoctrinated, so believed him. He would be smiling at me from the clouds. Oh, hi, like, uh, how are you today? Or when we cook Chinese food with burning fire, like uh, with some wood under the big wok, and all of a sudden, mom would be smiling at me and, and uh, a good child, red child. And then you write the diaries, you confess in your diary. I was a red child. I shouldn't confess, right? No, everybody got to write diary. They asked you to confess if you had any incorrect thought yes. and encourage you to talk to Chen Mai Mao by confess. I also encourage you to turn on your neighbors, your feminists. Have you heard anybody say something that's supposed to? Do you know their private thoughts? We extremely political, tight, censored, massive and civilian state. And uh, you cannot hide. Mao said politics is in our life every day. You got to talk about it every hour, every minute, every second. Even when you sleep, you're supposed to talk to Chen Mai Mao. You, well, you and, that's religion or not religion, right? Yeah, can it, correct me if I'm wrong, but actually not talking enough about Chairman Mao and the revolution was, that was considered evidence that you were counter-revolutionary. Just by, just like silence was considered a... No, you cannot be silent. Evidence, right. That's why when I heard silence, right. silence, I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You cannot reserve your judgment. You have to be actively come out to make your opinions well known. Because everybody's supposed to chant. Remember people got yeah. her house in the restaurant, they hold her face like this? Yes. Say it. Say it. If you cannot just say, can I can I just be quiet? Can I just be not political? No. Everybody has to be political every single day and hour. Think about what kind of life worth living like that. You cannot even have downtime anymore. Comedy shows are censored. You cannot mock some people 
or you cannot talk incorrectly because you will get canceled. They want to cancel everybody. When you have no more free speech, no more free mind, then you are no longer free people. You are enslaved. That, that the head you carry on your shoulders no longer belongs to you. Some people even self-censor now. Oh, I should not say that. Oh, I should not think like that. Yes. yes. Sorry, yes. I'm wrong. You know, it, it's crazy. It's exactly what happened during the his cultural revolution. Because I went through the entire process myself. You know, when I, when I saw Mao died when I was 12, that's my beginning of the awakening process to say, oh, he died. So that means he was human. And I started to question, I had a little bit brain left to say, well, somebody lied to me, somebody lied to my entire generation, an entire Chinese people population. And that's when I start to start my lifelong process of awakening. And I hope people don't Lily, have to go through that. Lily, I have a, a question that that to me is, I think that's one of the big differences that makes it a little hard to help people see what this is here in the United States is that there is no one charismatic leader. Like there is no man. There's not like one person who's pushing this here that we can look to and say, that's the infallible creator of this belief system. And, and, and so it, much like when we talk about, we also compare the social justice ideology to a cult. And again, there's no one cult leader. So I think it makes it hard for people to see what it really is because they think that you need that one person who's at the top of it, that one bad guy that you can identify and take him down and that'll take the ideology down. But that's not the way this operates this time in the United States. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, there was no single Mao-like leader and to lead this uh, social justice cancel culture movement, but there were thousands, little Mao. You know, you can say, hey, there are people who are in radical left. They could be elected representatives. They could be the big tech companies. Who, who knows those people are who want to cancel you if you don't even use their language, you post something you're not supposed to post, and it could be socialist and the Marxists who really wanted to redistribute wealth, they even don't recognize equity is Marxist term. So even though you don't have one supreme leader above this movement, but there were lots, lots of them, people just like him is controlling the narratives, talking points. Look at the Mao's tactics. He used propaganda machines, all the press, all the media, all the school systems to his advantage. Then he also um, threat, use sluggish behavior to threaten people, lock them up, torture to death, divide you and then make you come out to feel like uh, you have to be actively apologizing to public either um, be shamed or you go shame somebody else. It, it's just a constant struggle and uh, between different groups and then in the politics, it's all very similar tactic. So the tactic is very selfish way to forcefully divide people without any rational thinking facts and data and force that you, and you're not allowed to ask you questions. You got to obey. You know, you saw that during the last year's lockdowns, the summer lungs of looting and burning and, and the violence, you're not supposed to ask questions. You just have to obey. And the, now when they say you got to be loud, be active, the anti-racist now. So if you work for some work companies, you must go to training sessions, because you have to be actively anti-racist and read the books, even military. That's another common thing I'm really worried about. The military is supposed to be neutral in politics in our country. They swear to protect, defend US constitution and means all citizens' constitutional rights. But uh, what are they pushing onto military now? Walk, be an active anti-racist, loyalty test purge 
That's why I'm so scared. Other people don't feel the urgency, intensity, what could happen to this country. And now they're gonna violate your privacy to force you to take a vaccine, maybe have a vaccine passport trap you, then can go to door to door to talk to you, so-called to talk to you, but what if they go door to door to something else? We couldn't lose our human freedom in this country very fast. But the people, oh, you know, they might not feel the same way I do. So I, I feel like it's my duty as American citizen by choice to come out to warn people, please, we don't want to go down that way. We are all being enslaved. Yeah. Can, you know, I know that Mao was the single leader in China, but I think when a lot of people hear that, they imagine him being very active and going around and doing all these things that you're talking about. But in fact, Mao didn't really do anything other than give some advice to people. It, there's an entire apparatus that was doing all of this for him, even yes. the propaganda. He didn't yeah. write the propaganda. He maybe gave some direction once in a while and approved things here and there, but there was an entire propaganda machine that operated not completely independently, but with very little input from Mao that, and all of these things happened, not because there was one bad guy wandering around in boots, punching people. It was because there was an entire apparatus he inspired that was doing all this work for him. And so I think that apparatus exists in the U S re regardless of whether there's a person behind yeah. it. One person cannot do much. It's the whole system. It's the whole party. There are lots of communist party members who are on Mao's side. So you, you get the different groups fighting each other who is going to win. And you have then the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda department was at his fingertip. He used them very effectively to purge his enemies. And every day there were you know, those uh, articles and, and the radio stations and news come out to basically to defeat his enemies. Of course, he got lots of people similar to him, hardcore communists who wanted to make him a god because all those people were being critical key positions to share that power. You know, it's great to be an emperor, right? I mean, everybody who under you, who really to you support, you also become a part of an empire. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a very dangerous. And, and that's why, you know, I, I say that uh, uh, most people, you are not part of that political elite class in this country or 1%, 2%. You are just like me. We're just regular citizens. Why are we believing them and the fighting each other and uh, hate each other. I wanted to, you know, basically attack each other. Why? Because you believed in their propaganda, believe in their rhetoric. You lost independent thinking and the fact checking. You bought into social media every day, gave you notifications about something. You know, it's like a, I have immunity now. No matter what my iPhone sent to me, I'm a suspicious. But lots of young people don't have that immunity. They face them information every day when not it. it. It's really a big problem now. And then guess who pressured them to do that? There are lots of people in the social justice movement. You don't know who they are, but there are some big actors and bad actors. And, uh, and there's the other one who might be, you know, even Chinese government knows if we just play race car in America, and then we will weaken the society and uh, we will take over the world as number one dominating country in the whole world. Imagine that. Even the Chinese Communist Party knows that Americans' weakness to use by them, and they have a pamper propaganda machine here too. The Communist Party spies and the press, social media influence on YouTube, they're everywhere. They yeah. infiltrate our schools for past. 15 years, we just got rid of the Confucius Institute. And they still have TikTok. Chinese company track all our young people's data, but they have 80 million followers. It's like, oh, I would not, you know, let uh, any of my kids to download TikTok on their cell phone. So it, it, it's, it's, of course, the whole system is worked that way. 
very effectively where lots of Americans are asleep. They just have not wake up yet. Yeah. And this is the Soviets actually also knew they had planned to use race as a leverage to tear down the United States in the, in the same way. It's just that the Soviets, yes. they died before their plans could come to fruition. But it's pretty clear that the Chinese Communist Party picked those plans right back up and and kind of continued on the path. Right. I, I read the Chinese documents. I listen to Chinese news. Some of them come out of China. So I know, I know parties, uh, and sometimes they were speaking Mandarin Chinese, their policies, advisors, professors, they all know how to interfere with the U.S., a civil society, elections, schools, science, technology, Wall Street, media, social media, so they can win without fire, one shot. Can you imagine? We lose our country, a, a free country based on constitution, and got some communist country dominating the whole world. That will be the end of human freedom. I, I'm very scared. Yeah. Think about that future. Yeah. That's why we got to speak up and fight now before it's too late. Lily, what are you? Um, what are some of your tips on or advice on how to help people wake up. I get asked that question a lot as someone who left social justice ideology after having been in it for 20 years. And my background, I pushed it. I pushed it in my job, in my career. I um, I did what you talked about. I cut people out of my life if they were not in my ideology. My social media feed my echo chamber was just social justice people. And I believe that it was good. I believe this was a good belief system and, and it did it did function like a religion for me. Um, I was indoctrinated into it at an elite university when I was, you know, uh, 17, 18, 19 years old. And for me, because I left it after so long, I get that question a lot. How, how do you wake people up? And I've started trying to answer that question. There's no easy answer, but what do you, what would, what advice would you give people? Cause we have a lot of people in our audience who want to share their voice, help people in their life, maybe friends or family who are being seduced by some of this social justice ideology. What kind of uh, inspiration or advice would you give them? Well, first of all, thank you. What you're doing now is to media, you speaking up, and uh, use social media, your YouTube channel to educate people. Mm -hmm. I truly believe most human beings are nice people and because we all have so much common ground mm -hmm. and we all want to have a you know, good life and pursue self-interest happiness. It's, it's always the another side. They want to instill hatred into your head because that's how they win and, and gain their power. So we need to be kind together and uh, to talk to each other with respectful tone and the voice, not natures and not force them. And so first of all, we got to be respectful and kind. And if, if you have friends, families have different opinions, but you are already waking up, continue to engage them, have a dialogues. And uh, whenever they are ready to talk to you, you invite them to have conversations, just be there for them and still provide the love support they need. So they, they think you are cool. You are still a person, a friend or a family member. You're not an enemy or you're not just right or not just because you have different opinions. And I always tell people, please don't demonize anybody who is from another side. Most Democrats are good people. They might just not know the history. They might be just trusting government authorities too much. So you have to give them maybe alternative facts and data to think about. But at the beginning, though, before they get out of their brain box, they're not ready to look at your facts and data. They, they, they always get information from their source. So just as a person, continue to engage them in their lives and be there ready to help them when, when they want to have a conversation with you or, or ask you a question, then you start to you know, talk to them and I think we could, uh, you know, let's say people are already awake, but they're afraid. And that's when you have to master your fear. Like there, I, I believe there are lots of good people out there and te including teachers. I mean, how are they continue really 
to violate their conscience and their code of conduct to teach critical race theory. How come you don't see other white people like Pelosi, all those uh, white politicians come on now? Did they already denounce themselves as white privileged and they should uh, call themselves, you know, I am a racist, I have a bias or whatever. You know, it's always this hypocritical and stuff. They push on regular people, but the political ruling elites, including Hollywood people, they are so righteous, morally right. And, and we are just, uh, you know, if you love freedom, you have different opinions, then they give you a big name and hat to wear. You're racist. You're a bigot. You know, it's just lots of people don't agree with that, but they're afraid they can lose their job, their career, and, and they, they, they can be um, called racist. And so they don't want to come out public and speak it. But that's how you lose your freedom and liberties when you lose a country, destroy the country's uh, and moral values and culture ideas, or even destroy families. It, it's, it's, it's time for people who know what's going on, but be brave enough to join us to speak up. Like, like you did, Gary, you, you were not hiding after you woke up. You decided to take this message to the whole it, country. Yes, but it, I will say for anybody who's awake, but awake now, but afraid, it did take me about six months I was I was quiet for six months after I'd started waking up because I was so scared about what I might lose, which which those things are not I, I ultimately after those six months, I, I came to a place of understanding that I was more afraid of what would happen if I didn't speak up and what we would lose if I don't speak up. And I think people just have to get to that place where they realize the things I'm afraid of losing are nothing compared to what could be lost if I don't speak. Right. Tell your story. I yeah. have a Chinese friend I just uh, met recently. Think about what he could lose. He went to Chinese jail for seven years, house arrest for another six years when he came out. All his family members were hired by party to um, basically um, watch over his shoulder. So he finally made it to the United States and 2018 cannot even speak English yet. In this free country, he's continued to speak up, to appear on Chinese program TVs, writing articles, and the Chinese spies threatening him in this country, America, trying to get him killed, burn his car, and follow his car when he travels around countries, threatening him and get his uh, call him sometimes weird, you know, time to say. Shut up, or we're gonna kill you. And they wow. kill so think about it. He is risking his life to tell the truth. And I cannot even go home to see my family in China. I don't know what's gonna happen to me if I go home or to my family members. We all have to take that risk and choice to say, I'm gonna be quiet when I face evil, or I'm gonna stand up and fight. Because if you do die someday, live free or die, like the model in New Hampshire, you want to live on your knees or you're gonna lie down flat, let them run you over. Everybody got one life to live. I have done lots of deep thinking since I become publicly for, to, to publicly uh, anti-communist party and the communism, because I do have an extended big family still live in China. But I already warned my family members, I'm not going to be silenced in this free country. If we lose America, the world will be a very dark place. We have to speak up now because the Communist Party people, the Communist Marxists are everywhere. They have infiltrated into Europe and America still the shiny city, you know, on the hill to millions, millions of immigrants. Look at Cuba. Cubans were carrying U.S. flag. Hong Kong students were carrying U.S. flag. <laughs> we want to come to this country, but the left is saying, we are the racist, systemic racist country. <laughs> do, you okay, do you want to go to China, Cuba to live there just for six months? And we get them come here? Then you will know. You will know how, I bet those people go there, live a year, they will come back and kiss. American saw you when they entered the country. Lily, thank you so much for that. That's a great rant. Really <laughs> great impassion. Yeah, impact. 
there's something about in your voice. It's just this, uh, this great love of, of freedom and of individualism and of what the United States is supposed to stand for, the principles that we're supposed to stand for, and and you being someone who like you know what what is at stake and what could be lost. And I just I just appreciate you speaking about it so passionately. So thank I cannot you. help it. My husband said, <laughs> my husband said, slow down when you when you get so passionate and your English it becomes less good. And so I have to slow <laughs> down a little bit. But because I see the similarity, because yeah. I have this ability to tell stories. And because I feel I feel so blessed in this country, I need to give back. And how do I give back as American citizen? is to tell the truth, no matter whatever in front of me, whatever threats are coming my way, I'm not gonna be silenced. I cannot, because I love this country. I still want to get rid of communism in the world because I know what kind of suffering that is, no matter how beautifully they paint a picture for you, if you live in a utopian communist society, it's a big lie. It will never come. You will never come. You don't even have freedom to sing your songs, wear your clothes you like, have a hairstyle you like, and to um, get married, have kids. You all need the permission even in China today. Remember they had a one-child policy, and then two children, and now it's three, and now they follow your period cycle to say time to have a third kid. It's all about the control your life. You don't belong to yourself. There's no self-ownership. There's no civil liberty. There's no privacy. So I wonder why ACL, you would not come out to condemn all the government policies of violating civil liberties and privacy. I'm calling them out all the time. Me too. I think they work for the you know, civil liberties. And how about the feminists? All the feminists, my body, my choice. Where are you now? When the yeah. government trying to force people to do something to their body they don't want to do. Yeah. Don't you think freedom is about free to choose? You believe something is good, trying to convince people to do it, but don't force them with government force. If you don't do it, you might yeah. just go to jail, you might not go to school, you might not have your job, you might not travel. It's just insane. So we have to be consistent when it comes to our freedom, you know? And I hope people will learn from my stories that uh, this is a North Star for me it's our individual liberty. Nothing else matters. Yes. Here, here. Well put, Lily. <laughs> Thank you. Tell your husband much. you were passionate and yeah. clear at the same Thank time. You. Yes. Great. The more practice I do, my English gets better. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is good. So yeah. I know we talked about the beginning of the show, but um, before we wrap up, is there any, where can people find you and follow you? And if they want to book you to speak, at their school or their group? Like, how how do they do that? Where do they find you online? Well, the easiest way to reach me is my Facebook page um, called Lily for Liberty, L-I-L-Y, number four, Liberty. I have almost 20,000 likes now. Please take that to next level, cross 20,000. I have a YouTube channel called Lily Tom Williams and uh, Twitter also called Lily for Liberty. And so once we connect on social media, I, we can exchange emails, that's no problem. But I think my job as an educator speaker is to really use my personal stories. I will not force you to agree with me. I will always say, hey, please verify what I said. Don't take my words as final words. That's what you are supposed to do is be critical, independent thinker. I always tell students, go verify because some people's cultural revolution experience might be different from me because they were like 1%, 2% of political ruling class or their families were high level communist party officials. They had plenty of food. They could not even finish eating them or we were starving. You know, we live on food rationing coupons. So people's stories are different, depends on their individual circumstances. Um, but, but I will say 95% of people probably will tell you what I told about the common people's sufferings under communism is true. Just talk to Cubans, just talk to Venezuela people who run out of food, cats and dogs to eat, they're starving. And uh, in, in North Korean, 
they always put on propaganda show. So don't believe whatever you say on social media, on the mainstream media, you know, so, so check, so check, check out yourself, do research on your own and go to alternative media. And, yeah. you know, that, that's how we, you know, kind of make judgment, make choice yourself after you did all the research, just don't easily to be used. I hope young people will wake up slowly after they hear our stories, I hope so. Yeah, so I thank you so, so much for having thank me. Thank you, Lily. Thank you so much, Lily. Really enjoyed the conversation and uh, Thank you, Catherine. That's what we're supposed to do, right, as our citizens. I wish I could go to a radical left side to have conversation with them, but I normally don't get an invitation from them. <laughs> I do, I do invite, like, a, <laughs> I do invite middle groups, minority groups, non-profits, schools, Democrat teachers, allow me to have opportunity to tell my personal stories. Yeah. Just as an eyewitness of cultural revolution, I wouldn't be not partisan at all, but the personal story is powerful. It will make a connection with students instead of we just teach them the rhetoric, you know, that something they never experienced before. So eyewitness is good, right? I mean, like have some credibility, I hope so. Um, they but, say that they want to hear your lived experience, but they don't. Only if the lived experience validates their ideology. <laughs> well, that's yeah. The, I still think those people are minority. I think mm -hmm. most people in the middle would like to learn, would like to hear, and we just have to deliver the message and stories in an effective way. You know, we have to be nice and respectful and to make connections with them because really we are not each other's enemies. We have so much in common as human fellow citizens, but it is the enemies we don't see. We don't see where they are. They want to jerk the chains and, and, and eventually put that chains on our neck and you cannot brace, you really cannot brace after that. It's like a big wood on your neck. And, uh, and just read the book, 1984. Exactly yeah. what I described, what happened to us during the police state, cultural revolution under even today, the Communist Party dictatorship, 1.4 billion Chinese don't have a privacy and they're afraid, they're disarmed and they don't have yeah. free speech, they don't have free thoughts and they're, if you dare to ask questions, even your billionaires, you get locked up or you are forced to retire, sell your assets. If people don't they just understand, went after Jack people Ma. Redeem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people regime, yeah. you know, you know, I, 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 I'm really hoping that uh, after Cubans protest, maybe hopefully something more exciting that will happen and people will realize, you know, they are risking their lives too. You know what they're saying? We are not afraid because uh, otherwise you're going to die of starvation or, or some horrible, you know, police state anyway. So, so might, 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 might just come out, fight now where you still have strength, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, so hopefully that let's, uh, let's pray for more people to wake up and speak up. Yeah, well, yeah. we still have the ability in the U.S. here to, to have these conversations right. yeah. and to argue. So let's use it before we lose it. Correct, yeah. yes. Thank you, Lily, for being with us today. And you guys can find Lily online if you want to book her or talk to her or follow her. We've got all the links in the description. And especially if you are on the left and you disagree with some of what she's saying, why not invite her to give a talk or have a conversation with you? Thank you, Lily. Thank you. You have a good day. You too. You too. Bye.